Shadow Citizen will explore the shadows of an alternate reality. Your hosts, Rachel L. McIntosh and Rob Bostel. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Shadow Citizen. I'm Rachel L. McIntosh, and my co-host is Rob O'Sell. Rob, are you here? Yes, I'm here, Rachel. How are you? Oh, very good. Okay, listen, tonight is an awesome show, and it's an important show. And I want everybody to listen very carefully to what's going on in the show tonight. We have two very, very important guests it's a really important show. We're covering what happened to the American communications spy ship, the USS Liberty. I want everyone to listen closely to what's being said. This is where the details count. This show, as per usual, will be archived on AmericanFreedomRadio.com and it will be on ShadowCitizen.online, as well as YouTube, Vimeo, and SoundCloud. And I want to stress again, what this is is basically the history channel on steroids, but without the stock music. Uh, yeah, we're, this is living history. We have the survivors of the USS Liberty. This is a story that has been buried and not told. It's, uh, it's an embarrassment to our government and our, our strongest ally in the Middle East. This story has been buried. And so we're dealing with real life survivors, people that were there that day, you know, the men that went through this ordeal and they're here to tell their story. So this is a very important story, and it really does need to be told as often and as widely as we possibly can. So back to you, Rachel. That's right. Okay, so let me take everyone back to June 8, 1967. The USS Liberty was stationed off the coast of the Sinai Peninsula in the Mediterranean Sea. This was international war and presumed safe. The U.S. was there to intercept communications on behalf of Israel was in the middle of its six-day war with its Arab neighbors. That's why it was so surprising when suddenly three jet fighters and three motor torpedo boats began firing on the Liberty. The 10,000-ton vessel was hit with a barrage of machine gun fire, rockets, and napalm. And finally, after 75 minutes of this, a torpedo ripped a 40-foot hole in the hull of the ship, instantly killing 25 men. In all, 35 men were killed, and 171 men were wounded in the attack. The attackers were America's number one ally in the Middle East, Israel. The attack of the USS Liberty was 50 years ago, and it's haunted the survivors of this attack for multiple reasons. Survivor Marine Staff Sergeant Bryce Lockwood, he's here today to share with us all this amazing firsthand account. And I want to introduce him to everybody. It is my pleasure and my extreme honor to introduce everyone to former Marine Staff Sergeant Bryce Lockwood. Bryce, are you on the line? I am here. Thank you for joining us. I do appreciate this. It's really important that you're with us and you're sharing your story. So I imagine this is very difficult, and I'm very, very honored that you're going to share all this with us. For the people that just have no clue what happened that day, why don't you start off with what you were doing? The USS Liberty was the world's foremost intelligence collection vessel at the time in 1967. Most of that information is done now via satellite, but satellites 50 years ago were very rudimentary. The primary cruise for the USS Liberty was up and down the west coast of Africa. Uh, She was highly equipped with the most sophisticated uh, radio receiving equipment and computer equipment that was available at the time. We had the world's largest mobile computer, a UNIVAC, aboard ship. Uh, You could probably do as much now with your wristwatch. But anyway, (laughs) she was was stuck back in 1967. Her cruise was primarily up and down the west coast of Africa. The uh, colonies of Africa, many of them had just won their independence. Uh, Colonies that had belonged to Portugal, Spain, uh, Great Britain and France, and there was a tremendous influence both by Soviets and by the Cubans in sub-Saharan Africa at that time. And Liberty was charged with uh, monitoring what was going on between uh, Soviets and the Cubans as the African nations were gaining independence and gaining their freedom. 
the Mideast War was imminent. There had been uh, armies uh, amassed in the Sinai uh, area at the time by Egypt. They were not really a threat. They were primarily defensive. Their guns and tanks actually were dug in, uh, so they were not offensive. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, American National Security Agency decided that we needed to know what was uh, about to happen, what was going to happen uh, with the warring parties or the belligerent parties at that time. It was Israel was, uh, uh, of course, uh, the nation of Israel, and the countries called the United Arab Republic, which consisted of uh, Jordan, Syria, and Egypt, I uh, believe Libya was also uh, in on that, but those were the primary belligerent parties. We arrived on station, uh, I believe it was on the uh, 4th or 5th of June, I don't remember the exact date that we arrived on there, but <clears throat> the war had already begun. I was a watch section supervisor, voice intercept section supervisor. I distinctly recall our senior research officer, uh, Lieutenant Commander Dave Lewis at the time, uh, was giving us supervisors our instructions for uh, the crews. We were instructed to uh, intercept any voice communications heard at the time. Our primary targets were the Soviets. The Russians had five Tu-95 uh, high-performance, high-flying spy aircraft stationed at Alexandria, Egypt. They had indicated to the world that those aircraft were uh, given to the United Arab Republic were manned by Egyptian crews. Uh, that was not the case. They were manned uh, solely by uh, Russian crews that were wearing Egyptian uniforms, and uh, Egyptian troops were not allowed anywhere near them because of the sophistication of the intercept equipment. Those planes were flying spy missions over our U.S. 6th Fleet, and uh, our government wanted to keep track of them. That was our primary mission. Secondary mission was intercepting anything pertaining to hostilities between the Israelis and uh, the Egyptians, Jordanians, or Syrians. We were instructed that if we picked up a voice target in Hebrew, we were to identify it and drop it. We were not targeted against Israel. On the morning of June the 8th, we were overflown by several Israeli aircraft on several different occasions. There was a grand total of about eight spy missions or pho uh, uh, photograph missions over our ship. We did not realize that they were after us. We just thought that they had been in the area and just came over to check us out. The truth of the matter is they were checking out where all of our transmitting antennas were, all of our defense armaments were so that when they decided they wanted to get rid of us, they could do so quickly and efficiently. The morning of June the 8th, the Israelis had captured an entire Egyptian brigade in excess of 850 men. There was a tacit agreement between the Lyndon Johnson administration and the Israeli government not to mess with the Golan Heights, and that was a primary target of Israeli aggression. They wanted to go on heights, and I can't blame them for wanting that. The Syrians, for any reason or no reason, would try it out their artillery pieces and mortars and pound Israeli kibitzes below. And quite frankly, the Israelis were aggravating a little bit of that by uh, they would run tanks and, and uh, vest, uh, the, the trucks up to the area and kind of aggravate the Syrians. But the Golan Heights was a primary target. Golan Heights was defended by Syria, occupied by Syria. Syria was being provided militarily by the Soviet Union, and there were Soviet advisors there with the Syrians. For Israel to attack Golan Heights could very well have invited Soviet intervention, and that could have been a spark to begin World War III. So there was a tacit agreement between Johnson administration and the Israeli government not to mess with the Golan Heights. But the Israelis had plans to take Golan Heights on June the 8th, and here's a spy ship out there. The morning of June the 8th, those 850 Egyptian troops that had been captured were forced to dig their own graves and then brutally murdered many of them with their hands tied behind their backs with barbed wire. 
the truth of the matter is the Israeli troops that were guarding them were needed for the attack on Golan Heights, so they brutally murdered all of those Egyptian troops to free up their own troops for the attack on Golan Heights. Wow. I had never heard that story, that part. Wow. What, what is ironic about that, Rachel, uh, it was probably 30 years ago now, I had a uh, grain hauling business at the time and sort of casually picked up the morning paper, Springfield, Missouri, News Leader, and on the inside section there was a tiny article written by two Hebrew journalists, one from Israel TV, telling about the brutal murder of those Egyptian troops. Hebrew journalists spoke about and told the public what had happened. A tiny article buried on the inside of our newspaper. Yeah, I've, I've never heard that story ever. That's an amazing story. Thank you for sharing that. Wow. All right, so bring us back to your experience, what was going on that day. There were several violations of international law that day. We had had a drill general quarters uh, in the morning, late in the morning, and the uh, captain, Captain McGonigal, had come on the 1MC, the uh, internal uh, address system of the ship, and told us that we were uh, off a war zone, that we are in a dangerous area. We had to stay in close in order to be able to uh, listen to the communications that we were after, and we needed to be on our toes. We secured from the drill general quarters. I had been on a mission that was, had been authorized for civilian clothing, so I didn't have very many uniforms with me. I went to the uh, small store ship aboard, uh, aboard the Liberty and uh, purchased some uh, clean T-shirts and underwear and was at my rack in the after-birthing compartment, stamping my name in my new T-shirts and clothing. And uh, suddenly I heard some loud explosions topside. I had never been involved in uh, actual combat before, but I immediately knew that was not normal, that we were under fire. I dropped what I was doing immediately and started for my GQ station, which was below decks in the research uh, facilities of the ship. Uh, there were many of us down there. I don't know exactly how many, probably uh, 75 to 80 men that were in that area. This was sealed compartments below the water line, I remember Melvin Smith, Chief Melvin Smith, coming into our compartment and stating that it looks like we're under fire. It looks like we're going to have to start emergency destruction. Uh, that's something you don't want to hear when you have devoted much of your career to intelligence collection, processing, giving it to the consumer, many of whom were very senior uh, officers in our uh, government. But uh, it was something that had to be done, lest uh, a lot of very secret, top-secret information fall into uh, foreign hands. We had several large ditching bags, large canvas bags that had a lead weight in the bottom, brass furls around the side. We, the idea was to load all of our manuals, all of our magnetic tapes. We use uh, tiny little chips now to record conversations and so forth. In fact, whole movies will fitting your cell phone these days. But back then, we had to use magnetic tape. It was heavy. There was a lot of it. We had a lot of language manuals, a lot of code uh, deciphering manuals. All that had to go into these ditching bags. Uh, we had finished doing all of that, and uh, I was uh, finishing up a cup of coffee when it came over the uh, 1MC speaker system. Uh, break your cells. Torpedo attack starboard side. And uh, I remember having a little giggle with Ronnie Campbell, one of my dear friends at the moment. Well, they hit us with everything else. What else can they hit us with? Lieutenant Bennett, who was the division officer, opened the door out to the passageway from the compartment I was in. He said, Sergeant Lockwood, you come here a minute, please. And I started to step out into the hallway. And uh, Mr. Bennett, and uh, Lieutenant Commander Lewis, our uh, senior research officer, had just started to engage me in a conversation about these ditching bags with all the classified material in it. The idea was to get them topside, pitch them over the side, uh, sea water. Uh, we were uh, relatively shallow water as far as that sea is concerned, but 
should anyone be able to retrieve those bags after a period of a few days, what material was in there would have been unreadable, unusable. Mm-hmm. They're shooting top saw. That's the Marine's job to get shot at. It just engaged me in a conversation about that when there was a terrible blinding flash, uh, extremely loud noise. I was not to the deck. Uh, sort of semi-conscious, the thought that entered my mind at the moment, well, Lord, it looks like I'm coming home. I guess this is it. At least Lois and the kids are taken care of. Lois is my wife. I felt something cold, and I sort of stupidly looked down. I was sitting on the deck, and uh, there was water was gushing in. I thought, oh, my God, we're in trouble. And I struggled to my feet, and I heard a sailor moaning, behind me. I didn't find out till many years later who it was. His name is Joe Lentini. In fact, I uh, had just spoken with him on the phone a few minutes ago. Joe had taken a piece of shrapnel from an Israeli rocket that had gone through the ship and struck him in the thigh. And he had sat down on the floor in the passageway, on the deck in the passageway, and was leaning up against the ladder way that went to the next deck above, trying to put a tourniquet on that wound when the torpedo struck, uh, we had sheet steel that separated the working compartments. Highly classified information is on a need-to-know basis. So unless you were in this area with a need-to-know, you were denied access. And those compartments were separated by sheet steel. When the torpedo blew, it mushroomed that sheet steel plating like a gigantic mushroom, caught Joe Lentini's left leg and just made toothpicks out of it. And the water was coming in quite rapidly. You understand a 40-foot hole in the side. The ship had rolled heavily over to the port side, away from the hole, and as she was settling back down, that water was gushing in very rapidly. Mm -hmm. I uh, got my hands under Joe's armpits and tried to pull him loose, uh, he was wedged in tightly with a wreckage. I said, you've got to help me. I can't do it by myself, and I'm pulling as hard as I can. I said, come on, get your legs under you and push. I can't do it by myself. Come on, push, push. I, I saw him kind of stumbling around. I didn't realize what had happened to his left leg. He was able to get his right leg underneath him and push just hard enough to where I could pull him loose. Mm-hmm. Uh, by that time, water was rising very rapidly. It was almost to the overhead. We only had about a foot and a half space of uh, air. I said, here, get a hold of these pipes. There was a a bunch of cabling, uh, electric lines and antenna lines, cabling that was running along the overhead. I said, here, get a hold of these pipes. About that time, uh, the water was rushing back out the hole. There was an unconscious sailor that was being carried away with that water. And I just reached down, got a an arm around him and held his head up. There were a lot of sailors there. Uh, They were, uh, there was a lot of confusion, a lot of shouting. And uh, as as loudly as I could, I just hollered out, knock it off. If y'all don't settle down, none of us will get out of here alive. I remember hearing uh, the division officer, Lieutenant Bennett, apparently he was at the top of the ladderway saying, this is Lieutenant Bennett, open his hatch. There was, Apparently a period of time, I don't remember anything. The next thing I recall, I was down there alone with an unconscious sailor. They say that I carried a man out, was warned that I couldn't go back down there, that I did anyway. don't remember any of that. Uh, I just remember being alone with an unconscious sailor in the sea, coming in, going out. There was no light. The ship lost power when the torpedo struck. The only light that we actually had was what was coming through the torpedo hole, which was underwater. Gosh. Uh, The torpedo had struck a fuel tank. This is bunker fuel. Any of the listeners that are familiar with ships at sea know the stinking smell of heavy oil that's used to power ships. That oil was everywhere. Um, I tried to get the sailor up the ladder way, slip, dropped him, ship is rolling, water rushing out, he heads back out the hole, go back, get him, back up the ladder way, got about halfway up, a piece of the torpedo had struck the railing and Bennett 
sharply inboard. So there was only about a foot, a little over a foot of space there. I got to where that bent railing was, and everything's slippery from the oil and seawater. Dropped him again. There he goes back out the hole. Did I get him again? Get to the top of the ladder way, and the hatch is sealed shut. Pretty angry at that time, and trying to keep this sailor's head above water and pound on the hatch. Someone came down and opened the hatch. I didn't find out until many years later that it was a sailor by the name of Bobby Schnell that had uh, opened the hatch, and apparently he was doing something else because the only one that was there at the time was a sailor by the name of Phil Turney. Uh, the captain, Phil was part of the damage control team. captain had sent him down there to uh, get an idea how badly the ship was flooding, how badly she was hurt, whether or not we had to abandoned ship immediately, and uh, I remember Phil saying to me at the time, he said the captain has passed the order, prepared to abandon ship, said you need to get a life vest on and put one on this unconscious sailor. I, I did so, and uh, I, I tried to pick him up and carry him. The mess decks at the back part of the ship was where we had set up a temporary hospital. Uh, mattresses had been brought in from the birthing compartment, placed on the tables. Uh, Dr. Richard Kiefer was, uh, there were just many, many very seriously wounded people. Dr. Kiefer, while working on a man, had taken a bunch of shrapnel across his stomach. He had 30-some pieces of shrapnel buried in his stomach. And um, he, he said that it was important for the men that were heavily wounded not to fear uh, but what the doctor had things under control. He had gone back to his stateroom, put a clean shirt on, put a life vest on, and buckled the life vest very tightly around him to stop the bleeding from his own wounds. Oh, my gosh. And Dr. Dr. Kiefer spent the next, in excess of 30 hours, operating nonstop on seriously wounded people. We were told that we needed to go to the port side of the ship, the left side of the ship. I was placed on the deck in the radio room. All of our transmitting antennas were destroyed. Our emergency frequencies were being jammed by the Israelis. That, by the way, is a violation of international law. Tactical frequencies, that's fair game. You're in a war zone. Tactical frequencies are fair game. But... In international agreements, distress frequencies are off limits to jamming. The Israelis were jamming our distress frequencies. We had a one antenna, a whip antenna, which had been not used, so there was a there was no heat to it. The Israelis were using heat seeking missiles so that every transmitting antenna that we had had a missile strike against it and destroyed all of those transmitting coils. This one whip antenna was not in use. We had a radio, a radioman by the name of Terry Halbardier. Incidentally, he uh, was just awarded both his Purple Heart and Silver Star for his gallantry in action in 2009 for what he had done that day way back in 1967. Terry got a roll of coaxial cable while we were under fire, took it from the transmitting uh, equipment in the radio room to that whip antenna. Um, he got a lot of shrapnel wounds, nothing terribly uh, serious, but bloody wounds nevertheless. Hooked it to that whip antenna, and uh, one of the ra radio men had figured out that when Rockets were being fired at us. The Israelis could not use their jamming techniques because it would screw up the flight of the rockets. So while rockets were being fired at us, that uh, one whip antenna was fired up, and this Mayday went out. Firefox, Firefox, this is Rockstar, Rockstar, under attack by unidentified surface, naval, and air units require immediate assistance. And as soon is that Mayday was acknowledged, the shooting stopped. We had been circled by three Israeli motor torpedo boats. 
the Israelis were using unmarked aircraft, which is a violation of international law. So we did not know who was attacking us until the torpedo boats appeared. They were flying the Israeli flag on the motor torpedo boats. One of our deck officers was Jewish. It is my understanding when he saw the torpedo boats coming, flying the Star of David, he burst into tears. I saw uh, some sailors carrying three inflatable life rafts through the radio room to put over the side. I heard a revving of engines and more machine gun fire. Rachel, mind you, there were 3,100 machine gun strikes on the Liberty. The Israelis use a much larger machine gun than ours. They use a 30-millimeter machine gun. The shell is two and a half times the size of our standard 50 caliber Browning machine gun shell. The projectile is the size of a cigar. There were 3,100 of those strikes on our ship. As soon as those life rafts were pulled over the side, I heard a revving of diesel engines and more machine gun fire. One of those sailors came back inside the radio room and he said, I don't know what we're going to do now. The Israelis had machine gunned those life rafts, severed the line which held one of them to the ship, came in and picked up that life raft. That is my understanding that life raft labeled U.S. Navy is on display in the Israeli Naval Military Museum as a trophy of war. We didn't realize uh, there were two helicopters that came over. I did not see them myself, but I heard from the crew members that were topside. The Israelis said that they sent helicopters over to rescue, see if there were any survivors in the water. Excuse me? Those helicopters were loaded with fully armed troops with automatic weapons and hand grenades. So I ask you, uh, what are you going to do with automatic weapons and hand grenades? Shoot sharks? They quite obviously were not there to rescue survivors. They were there to make sure everyone was dead. Time-wise, this whole attack, uh, how long? Rachel, the official... Uh, the official timeline said 75 minutes, which would have been from the time the first projectile struck the ship until the last shot was fired, which was by that motor torpedo boat, which riddled the life rafts. Mm -hmm. 75 minutes. But that does not take into account the troop helicopters that came over later. Apparently, uh, the Israelis realized that the jig was up we're apparently not going to sink right away. A U.S. 6 fleet had been uh, set a mayday and acknowledged it and apparently recalled those two helicopters. Some minutes later, I don't recall exactly how long, here comes the sound of more helicopter blades. That helicopter had the U.S. Naval Attaché aboard it. His name was Ernst Castle. He was a commander of the United States Naval, the U.S. Navy, in Tel Aviv. He dropped a brown paper sack on the front forecastle, weighted down with an orange. His calling card was in that brown paper sack. On the reverse side of his calling card, it said, Have you casualties? Rachel, there was blood everywhere, body parts. That paper sack landed right next to the severed leg of one of the deckhands, top side. Oh there were nine men that were killed. There were bodies lying all over the deck. There's blood everywhere. This bag just comes down with this guy's calling card in it? That's what you're telling yeah, me? This is, an, this is an Israeli helicopter with a U.S. Naval Attaché, Commander, United States Navy, Ernst Castle, aboard it drops this paper sack with his calling card, lands next to a severed leg, and it says, have you casualties on the back of it? It is my understanding that the skipper, Captain McGonigal, was so angry that he popped him the social finger, and Commander Castle took that as meaning one casualty, and that's what he reported. There was one casualty. Wow. Rob, my co-host Rob probably wants to say something right now. Rob? 
I can't imagine being, you know, under uh, the deck, you know, not being out able to see what's going on out around you. And over 3,000 rounds, machine gun rounds hit the ship. And I've heard casually, uh, you know, not everybody was killed, but injured. You know, injuries and deaths were seventy percent of the crew. Is that is that correct? There were uh, two hundred eight total Purple Hearts awarded. Actually, we had some men that uh, did not report their wounds. Um, Jack Beatty, who was one of the the uh, he was a machinist mate and had been topside on the deck, has some pieces of shrapnel buried in the back of his skull that the VA just recently found out about in an X-ray. Uh, there was a Navy chief by the name of Joe Bankert that uh, just told me a few months ago that uh, he had one of those machine gun projectiles buried in his calf. And uh, there were just so many very, very seriously wounded that minor wounds like that just, there was no way you could get to them. And uh, Chief Bankert told me that he got out a spike at knife and dug out that projectile and and put it put a bandage on it himself and he never got a purple heart but if you take away the 34 who were killed their awards their purple heart awards were posthumous from the 208 that were officially awarded that gives you a total of 174 that were wounded out of a crew of uh, 294 wouldn't a, a ship like this, because it was off the coast of Egypt, it was in international waters, but shouldn't it, if it had some sort of protection around it? Normally, boats like that aren't out there on their own without some sort of protection. Is there anything you can comment on that? Commander Lewis had requested from Sixth Fleet for a destroyer escort while we were there, and he was told by Sixth Fleet that you're in international waters, you're a clearly marked ship, a non-combatant, flying American flag, there's no need. And let me bring up a few points about that. The Israelis claim they didn't see a flag. Uh, they claim we, they thought we were an Egyptian ship. They claim that they thought they had been shelled from the sea. What they claim was shelling from the sea was their own troops blowing up captured Egyptian ammunition. So that, that excuse fails. They claim they didn't see a flag. They shot down two flags. We ran up three. Our signalman, Joe Metters, uh, lives in Corpus Christi, Texas. Joe Metters is out there running flags up while the Israelis are shooting them down. The last flag he ran up was the holiday flag. That's the largest one we have aboard ship. The Israelis claim they couldn't see a flag because of the smoke. Well, we didn't have any smoke until they dropped napalm all over us and set raging fires. If you buy their claim about the El Qasir, El Qasir was a World War One. Horse carrier, troop transport from World War I. She had not been to sea for 20 years and was waiting to be cut up for scrap. Now, Israel claims to have the best intelligence in the world. Who's doing the job? That excuse fails. I should bring up that U.S. ships are painted gray with highlighted markings in English lettering. GTR stands for General Technical Research. Figure 5, she was a fifth of her class. GTR stands for General Technical Research, which means she is a non-combatant. You do not fire at non-combatant ships. Every attack ship at sea is supposed to have a copy of James, all the world's fighting ships aboard it. You just don't shoot at somebody without making sure what your target is. Egyptian ships were painted black with gray markings in Arabic script. Every road sign in Israel is paint, is marked in both Hebrew, Arabic, and English because of the conglomeration of people that are there. They had been under British rule for many, many, many years. So every road sign in Israel has both Hebrew, Arabic, and English lettering on it. So don't tell me that you can't tell the difference between Arabic script, and English lettering. That excuse fails. Oh, I suppose uh, in one of the videos that came out, uh, Dead in the Water, that the BBC did several years ago, there's an interview with uh, the Israeli admiral. And incidentally, he was the father of the 
uh, skipper of the torpedo boat that fired the fatal torpedo, and he says, well, they are similar. Yeah, excuse me, they're both ships. That's where the similarity stops. El Qasir was about uh, one-third smaller than the Liberty was. Had the Israelis been firing their torpedoes at El Qasir as they claim, they would have passed harmlessly underneath the El Qasir because of the difference in the draft. All of their excuses fail in the light of facts. Well, I guess the next question to ask then is why? If we're an ally of Israel, why would Israel attack you know, an ally's ship? Um, <clears throat> personally, I believe there's uh, some very serious reasons. Number one is the, the execution of excess of 850 Egyptian troops. That is a very serious violation of international law. Uh, number two was uh, the Israeli desire to uh, seize Golan Heights. Uh, and, and here's an interesting little side note here. About six weeks ago, I was giving a lecture in Kansas City, and I had mentioned that uh, there had been some rumors that the Israelis had gotten a hold of the Syrian general and bribed him to pull his troops back away from the Golan Heights so the Israelis could take it more easily. And I see this gentleman getting all excited. He's uh, Middle Eastern dress, and he holds up his hand and says, my name is Fadi. My uncle was an officer in the Syrian army, and what you're saying is true. The third reason should really send shivers down your spine. Lieutenant Commander Dave Lewis, who was our senior research officer, had approximately the same wound that I did. I was facing the torpedo and wearing glasses, so my eyes were protected. Uh, Mr. Lewis was standing perpendicular to the torpedo, and his eyes were sealed shut by the uh, shrapnel and uh, debris from the torpedo. We were both medevac to the carrier of the USS America. When Mr. Lewis received his eyesight, his eyelids were lanced open some four or five days after the attack. And uh, I happened to be in the passageway aboard the America and, and saw him reading an eye chart. And um, I stood there patiently and waited for him to finish with the Navy corpsman. And he turned around and saw me, and he said, Sarge, it's so good to see you, and grabbed my hand in a very strong handshake. Mr. Lewis was summoned to the stateroom of Admiral Larry Geis, who was commanding officer of Task Force 6. Task Force 6 included the carriers USS Saratoga, USS America, and the USS Little Rock, which was a guided missile cruiser, which was uh, the uh, flagship for uh, Admiral Bill, oh gosh, his name just escaped me. He was commander of the Sixth Fleet, but <clears throat> Admiral Geis was commander of uh, Task Force 6, and he summoned Mr. Lewis to his stateroom and swore him to secrecy and said, I have been feeling guilty about this, and I wanted someone to know for posterity. He said, I'm swearing you to secrecy until after my death. But he said, I had ordered aircraft to come to your rescue. They were ordered back by Washington. Captain uh, Joe Tully, who was skipper of the USS Saratoga, had launched aircraft, and some of those aircraft had nuclear weapons aboard them. They were ordered recalled. Captain Tully assumed that the recall was a result of having those nuclear weapons aboard. He ordered them recovered, uh, ordered the nuclear weapons off and rearmed with conventional weaponry, refueled them and relaunched them, and again notified Washington. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara ordered them back. And now Admiral Geis is upset, and he got on the line and said, I want to hear that from higher authority. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara said, here's the president. Lyndon Johnson get on and said, get those aircraft back. I will not have my allies embarrassed. Now, here's the tickler. The Israelis were using unmarked aircraft, and we did not know who was attacking us. How did Lyndon Johnson know his allies were attacking us? There's a very good possibility that there was collusion between the Israeli government and Lyndon Johnson to set us up as a sacrificial lamb as an excuse for beginning 
the United States into involved in war with Egypt. That's really quite scary. Can I ask you a personal question? How do you feel today when you think about Israel? Are you able to talk about that? There's a United States congressman by the name of Paul Finley, who for 22 years was a Republican congressman from Illinois. Abraham Lincoln's seat in Congressman Finley's office is a beautiful leather sofa, which had adorned Abraham Lincoln's law office in Springfield, Illinois, many years ago. Congressman Finley wrote a book called Speaking Out several years ago. Mm -hmm. In that book, there is a full chapter devoted to the attack on the United States ship Liberty. In that chapter, he lays blame for 91101 directly at the feet of our own U.S. Congress for not investigating the attack on the Liberty. When Israel got away with not doing anything about the attack on the Liberty, they realized they could get away with anything they wanted to. And that really upset our Arab neighbors. Uh, Israel has run roughshod over the Palestinians. They treat them like vermin. In 2014, when uh, that second intifada, the Israelis just ran rampant over the Palestinians. The civilian kill ratio in 2014, 600 to 1. 600 Palestinians for one Israeli civilian that were killed. There was a grand total of three Israeli civilians killed, 1,800 Palestinian civilians. How can you justify that? I can't. Yeah, I can't either. And we had a a past guest on, Anna Baltzer, and she didn't go into any of that. She just talked about life in occupied Palestine and, uh, you know, what they've had to endure. This is an open-air prison camp, and uh, Israel is able to get away with just about anything. You know, you mentioned before how this boat you know, did not have a destroyer group around it. And I'm sorry I keep saying boat. I know I shouldn't say that. It should be ship. You, you mentioned that Johnson knew that it was his ally, even though these were unmarked airplanes. And so it does really sound like this was meant to be a, a sacrificial lamb, as you called it, and, you know, what we discussed in the past as a false flag event where uh, you know, a government body or allies attack themselves to try to blame it on somebody else to get the people riled up to go into war. So, Rob, there. this is not the first time that uh, a subject like this has come up. Uh, if you dig into the uh, conversations and tapes during the uh, Jack Kennedy administration, there is a conversation between Curtis LeMay, who was the commanding officer for the Strategic Air Command at the time, and David Shoup, who was the Marine Corps Commandant. And David Shoup was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. There was a discussion between those two men about the necessity for doing something about Cuba, and they had discussed using the U.S. ship to be uh, supposedly attacked and uh, is uh, an excuse for getting involved in more serious conflict. The sacrificial lamb was to have been the USS Oxford, which was one of the sister ships of the uh, USS Liberty, the USS Pueblo. It is my understanding, I cannot prove this, but it's my understanding that the skipper of the uh, USS Oxford had gotten wind of it and did not go where he was supposed to go. I'm I'm currently at a Naval Cryptologic Veterans Association reunion in Nashville, Tennessee. One of the gentlemen who is here with me is a longtime acquaintance of mine. He had been aboard the USS Maddox during the Tonkin Gulf uh, incident, and uh, the USS Maddox had been attacked by uh, North Vietnamese patrol boats. But the deal of it is the Maddox and the Turner Joy were sent by the Johnson administration into the Tonkin Gulf to provoke this incident. Now, there's a lot of newspaper men that say that never took place. Well, I can tell you from a gentleman that I know personally was there, it did take place, and the Maddox was attacked by North Vietnamese. 
but it was an attack which was provoked by our own government. So McNamara coming out and saying that the uh, Gulf of Tonkin incident was all made up is not true. It did happen, but it was it happened as a, a provocation to uh, lure them into war. You have it. Yeah, this has been going on for a long, long time, and people ignore history because I guess the the winners get to write the history that they want. And maybe you should talk a little bit about how all of the crew was ordered to not speak out about this subject. I was kind of an oddball. Um, my permanent base was in Bremerhaven, Germany, and I was on temporary duty aboard the Liberty. Uh, after uh, my wounds had pretty well healed up, I'd spent 10 days aboard uh, in the hospital aboard the USS America, and then I was ordered to go back to the Liberty, who was at that time in dry dock in the island of Malta, I spent one night aboard her there in Malta, and uh, uh, incidentally, uh, mattress, my sleeping quarters, was missing. I had no place to sleep. That was one of the first mattresses that had been taken into uh, the mess decks to use for uh, emergency surgery that was done on the severely wounded. So uh, Tom Van Lane, who was uh, one of our corpsmen, said, well, Sarge, you can sleep up here in sick base. So there's three racks up there. Uh, he said, you, nobody bother you. He said, you can just sleep whichever one you want. But he said, I hope that doesn't get to stinking in the night. And I said, what's that, Tom? And he pointed to a box that was about uh, 18 inches square that was over in the corner. And it was labeled unidentified human body parts. Oh, God. And that, that's what's buried in the mass grave at Arlington Cemetery. Wow. And two of the men that work for me are in that mass grave. How do you feel going forward? Do you feel proud to be American, or are you upset about America because of the liberty? Well, I have here a copy of the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 8. To define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations. Uh, this is uh, uh, clearly a felony, and Congress has never investigated it. Never has an investigation done. Wow. Shadow Citizen will explore the shadows of an alternate reality. Your hosts, Rachel L. McIntosh and Rob Bostel. Welcome back to the second hour of Shadow Citizen. Thank you so much to everybody that's been listening. This has been an historic event for us here at Shadow Citizen, and I hope you're picking up everything that's been said and taking it to heart because we don't want this loss, this image that uh, our last guest, Bryce Lockwood, just gave to you. Bryce, is there anything else that you wanted to add to what you just told us? Uh, you, you had asked me about uh, swearing to secrecy. I had heard that most of the men who were still aboard the Liberty, Admiral uh, Isaac Kidd came aboard the Liberty while she was en route to the Malta for dry dock repair and had uh, told the crew, okay, I'm taking off my admiral stars here. Now I'm one of you fellows. Tell me what happened. And uh, they bared their hearts and told him what had happened. It is my understanding he then put his stars back on and he said, okay, now I'm an admiral again. If you ever whisper a word about this to anyone, your family, your friends, your wives, you will go to jail or something worse for the rest of your lives. When I got to my back to my home base in Bremerhaven, the Navy sent a DAG officer, a Navy lieutenant commander, all the way from the States to Bremerhaven, Germany, to get me to sign some papers to secrecy. And excuse me, what he gave me to read did not specifically say, don't talk to anyone about the liberty. It was all about classified material, and this is the sort of thing that, Frequently, when you're in that line of work, you have to read it and make sure you understand you don't divulge these secrets, and these are the penalties that come as a result of it. So I freely signed it, and excuse me, when we were in the secure spaces among fellows that were doing the same line of work, I spoke quite freely about it. But I did not say anything outside of the secure spaces. I didn't say anything to my wife. You didn't say anything to your wife? No, I did not. And I was a mess when I got back home. I had fever blisters all over my face. When 
the morning that I got back to Bremerhaven, Germany, I didn't have a key to get in the apartment. Uh, I had to borrow a, a uniform from one of the Marines aboard the USS America. There happened to be a African-American Marine who was the same size I was, who was the same rank as I was, I loaned me a khaki uniform and Unfortunately, I had to wear that until I got back home. It was a grand total of about four days. And uh, when I was back aboard the Liberty, wearing that uniform, every time that you went up or down a ladderway to get from one air of the ship to another, that oil from that ruptured tank was everywhere. That was all down the front of my trousers. It was that stinking, heavy bunker oil. When, when I got to the apartment, the neighbor lady opened the door, and she said, Oh, Bri, she said, uh, Lois is out to the base getting the mail. She said, come on in here, I'll get you a cup of coffee. My wife had been to the base, got the mail, come back, and uh, Betty Bragg said, uh, Lois, you need to come in here for a minute. And she stepped in, and uh, she had just gotten a letter that her grandfather had passed away. My wife was closer to her grandmother than she was her own parents. And then here I am, just a mess. My youngest daughter just burst into tears. That's not my daddy. It was uh, pretty disturbing. That sounds horrible. I'm literally, I'm going to bust into tears. Wow. How Can I just ask one question? Because I do want to talk to our next guest, who, who you recommended, and I know you're excited that he's here. Everybody today is aware of post-traumatic stress disorder. Back then, it doesn't seem that it was made such a big deal of. Do you feel like you lost out on what the people today are receiving as uh, treatment for post-traumatic stress? Or do you feel like, uh, give me your opinion about that. How did you how did you make out after all this? This is horrific. <clears throat> yes, I was having difficulty. I'd wake up in the middle of the night with terrible nightmares or my, my next tour of duty after my tour in, in Bremerhaven was to Vietnam. And, uh, y y yes, it was very, very difficult. God, I've been having trouble now getting my thoughts together. Uh, the, they say today that the best way to get over post-traumatic stress disorder is to talk about it. Right. And the military and the Veterans Administration have hired uh, exceptionally well-qualified psychologists in a group session to help veterans suffering from it to get through it. But that was not available back in my day. I just had to put up with it. Right. Wow. My wife said that I woke up in the middle of the night. One night I was under the bed and I was pounding on the uh, underside of the bed. Open his hatch. Oh, my gosh. Wow. How this is just amazing. Thank you for everything that you've done for us. I really appreciate this, and I appreciate you speaking to us, and I hope that help talking about it has been helpful for you. I hope it's helpful for everyone that's listening to this show. I really do. And I'm going to talk to this next guest now, and I'm going to leave you on the line a little bit just so you can say hi to him because I know you like him and you, you're a fan of him. For the people listening... We have heard from a man who was actually on board the USS Liberty. Now we'll hear from a politician who got involved with the USS Liberty from a different perspective. Our next guest is Paul Norton Pete McCluskey. He's a former Republican politician from the U.S. state of California who served for 15 years in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1967 to 1983. He ran on an anti-war platform for the Republican nomination for president in 1972, but was defeated by President Richard Nixon. He's a decorated U.S. Marine Corps veteran of combat during the Korean War, being awarded the Navy Cross, the Silver Star, and two awards of the Purple Heart. He published a book called Truth and Untruth, Political Deceit in America in 1972. One of McCluskey's enduring leg legacies is his co-authorship of the 1973 Endangered Species Act. In 1986, McCluskey engaged in debate about Israel and Palestinian issues with Jewish Defense League founder, and 2,000 people attended this debate, which took place in San Francisco. It was eventually turned into a short film titled Why Terrorism, and was produced by Mark Green. 
As an opponent of the Iraq War, McCluskey broke party ranks in 2004 to endorse John Kerry in his bid to unseat George W. Bush as President of the United States. In April 2007, McCluskey switched his affiliation to the Democratic Party. He's here today on Shadow Citizen to tell us about how he got involved with the USS Liberty. It has to do with someone claiming to be the Israeli pilot who refused to shoot at the USS Liberty. Are you with us? Yeah, I am. I I found my file on the Liberty, so I can give you specific dates and specific statements, Dal. It's a file I put together over 20 years ago. uh, But first, let me just say how proud I am of Sergeant Lockwood. I, uh, as Marines, uh, it's one branch of service. We think sergeants are uh, more important than lieutenants, and I uh, I was a second lieutenant. Thank you. But uh, what questions can I answer for you? Oh, gosh. Well, first off, we, I, as you know, I got your phone number because I was on this email thread. I was trying to pull in the Liberty survivors to be on this radio show to, like, relay this story to the rest of the world. I didn't want it to fall down the memory hole. And somebody said, there's an Israeli pilot out there who refused to fire on the ship. And that Israeli pilot, he was in jail for five years. And this, they said, he, he's now an American citizen. He's in Maine. And so all these people on this email thread were going back and forth, and they said, well, McCluskey's talked to him, and somehow I got your phone number, and I called you. I didn't even know who you were. I didn't know you were somebody who ran for president. I'm just like, i got to talk to this guy, McCluskey. So I'm really excited that you – I'm 89 years old. It's a wonder I know you remember me. But I can (laughs) tell you how I first came in touch with this situation. I have the letter right in front of me in the memo. Uh, in January 1983, went to work for a law firm in Palo Alto where I'd practiced before I went to the Congress. And uh, in 1982, I got a call from Jim Ennis, or maybe it was early 83. And Jim had been contacted by a woman who said that there was a, a former Israeli pilot in jail in New York, and he wanted to get... Uh, witness protection or testify in front of the Congress because he was afraid when he got out of jail he'd be deported back to Israel and he'd be court-martialed. And this man had alleged that he was a pilot and the, I think the executive officer of eight flight, a flight of eight mirages which had attacked the Liberty. Well, I, uh, I asked a former Marine that had served with me who was New York replacement and an attorney to go see this man. His name was Anom and A M N O N T A V N I, also known as Even Tov, E V E N T O V, and he was then incarcerated. I think it was Rikers Island, as a prison in Manhattan. And my uh, former PFC, uh, who had been wounded right behind me in Korea, he went over with an attorney named Dragna to interview Even Tov in the prison, and. Uh, uh, by reason of that, uh, the attorney, and I, I wanted to test uh, whether or not this guy was for real, if he really had been an Israeli pilot, if he really was afraid of going back to uh, being deported back to Israel when he got out of jail. And the interesting thing about it, this woman that had called Jim Ennis uh, had said that Tov had wanted to talk with somebody who could get him either a hearing before Congress or witness immunity from the FBI. Well... When Dragna went to see them, uh, they reported back to me, and I have this in writing. They visited Tov in Foley Square, I think they call it, and they took notes, and they wrote this sentence, and sentence, quote, He said he was the executive officer on the flight, that they had circled over the Liberty several times, that he saw both black and white sailors on the deck, so it had to be an American ship, that there was a small American flag at first, but they ran up a much bigger American flag. He reported to his base that the ship was American, but was told to attack anyway. He refused to fire and flew back to his base. He went to his home or apartment, but was subsequently taken into custody. He mentioned the name Sharon at some time in the discussion. He said his love to his country, Israel, but he was afraid to go back, and apparently he'd been court-martialed in Israel. In any event, uh, they, uh, Dragna and my friend Artie McHugh, the, the poor police officer, uh, believed that he was 90% sure. They weren't sure about him. He said he was intelligent. He was a good-looking guy. He seemed uh, well-spoken. Uh, McHugh had also interviewed the young woman who uh, had called to Jim Ennis. 
and she was employed in, in some capacity in New York. Uh, I have the address here uh, and her name, but I, I won't put it on television at the moment to embarrass her. But in any event, uh, their belief was that uh, he was for real. Well, I was uh, then practicing law in Palo Alto with a, a partner in a large, large firm in San Francisco called Brobeck, Flager, and Harrison. And uh, the old firm that I had was becoming the biggest one in Palo Alto, but it's called um, it was Wilson, Wilson and McCloskey. At one time, it's now as Uncini, a Goodrich and Rizzotti fine law firm of 600 lawyers. But I'm going to farm when I'm talking to you here up in Northern California. Any event, I... Uh, I finally got word that Tove was had been moved to the uh, Port Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary, Port Leavenworth, Kansas, and that's the location of the uh, Army War College, but it's a small little town. It was bypassed by the railroad, so there's only the War College and the, the prison there, and I went to visit Tove, and uh, it was a fun interview. I have the, have the minutes here of what he said. Uh, um, he was afraid of going back to Israel. He was afraid that he would be executed, that they would court-martial him as a traitor. And he said he loved his country, and he was sorry about the attack. Uh, he, um, let's see what I have here. I've got it written down exactly what he said. He was, incidentally, he was a chess champion of, of Livermore. This was now 86, and he, he was due to be a... a He'd been under a, either a five or fifteen year sentence, but he was supposed to get out in November of 1986. And uh, any event, uh, he he told me the whole story. He, I said I could probably get him an interview. I still had friends in the Congress. I could probably get him public testimony before the Congress, and that once he testified publicly, I doubted the Israelis would ever punish him uh, thereafter. Uh, but I had friends on the Armed Services Committee that were interested in this. One of them uh, was a fellow named Ron Dellums, a black congressman from Oakland. He was on the Armed Services Committee. Any event, uh, Tove uh, asked me before I left, he said, uh, uh, would you, oh, he was a trustee. He was very, very well trusted. He was liked, uh, the warden liked him uh, <laughs> when he introduced me to him in the meeting room there with other people meeting with their relatives at Fort Leavenworth. And uh, he said, incidentally, I go to the synagogue on Sundays, and I know there's an Israeli colonel going to the war college. And he gave me his name and his phone number. He said, when you go out of town, would you call him uh, and ask him if he'd meet me at the next synagogue? So when I was driving out of town, you have to rent a car in Kansas City to drive over there. I stopped in a phone booth and uh, and called the colonel. And this very heavy foreign accent came on the line. I told him that he had a countryman in the prison and uh, that wanted to meet with him. He was an Israeli patriot. And uh, would the colonel meet with him? And he said, yes, he would. But he, that's a, that was the limit of the conversation. So I left, came back to California. Well, uh, some months later, uh, I got a, a call or a letter from Tove. And he'd been transferred to the Springfield Penitentiary in Missouri, which is kind of an out-of-the-way place. It's hard to get to Springfield. And I, I called my friend, uh, been my debate partner in law school. He'd been the number two guy to, Ehrlich, uh, to um, Richard Nixon, John Ehrlichman. But we'd been friends from law school uh, when I went to Korea. He and his wife looked after my wife. Well, John was out of prison now. And I called him. I said, John, tell me about Springfield, Missouri. And he laughed. He says, we call that the ice box. He'd been number two to Nixon for five years. He went to jail for trying to cover up Nixon Watergate. He said, we call it the ice box. That's where they send federal prisoners that they don't want to have the press or other public access. Well, I uh, I went down to see uh, Tove in in the, uh, this is the summer of 1986 now. Yeah. And he was scheduled to get out in November. And he said, Congressman, he <laughs> He said, can you do something for me? He said, they put in swastikas on the wall. They won't give me kosher food. And can you call this guy? He's the head of the B'nai B'rith in St. Louis, and I'd like a rabbi to come down here and set these guys, these are Southerners, and they're treating me like I'm a traitor or something. So I called the head of the B'nai B'rith in, in St. Louis, and he sent a rabbi down, and I later uh, I got a note from, from Tove that uh, the rabbi had indeed gotten better treatment from him from the warden there. I talked with the wardens in both 
uh, Springfield and before that in Fort Leavenworth. Any of them. So uh, as as the time approached, he was due to get out in November, and he was scared to death that when he was released from prison, the Israelis would pick him up. Well, it turned out, and as I followed it, that he he wrote me one letter, and he uh, he had been approached by an English television station, the Thames T H A M E S company, that wanted to make a uh, a uh, movie of him, and he thought and had told me that if he could get some publicity, maybe the Israelis wouldn't treat him. Otherwise, they thought they'd execute him. In any event, he was sent to New York and discharged. And I followed up with the New York U.S. Attorney's Office, and I couldn't find any information. There was no reference that, that uh, even Tov or uh, Abdon Tavani had uh, arrived in New York or been uh, discharged or that he'd been given over. And he had said at one time he was afraid they would turn him over to the Israelis and they would deport him back to Israel and hold up court martial secretly and kill him. And I haven't heard from Tov since that time. I have one letter from him attached to the file here. Uh, but uh, there's no quite Oh, I should say one other thing. Uh, later, uh, I met a man named Victor Ostrovsky, O-S-T-R-O-V-S-K-Y, who had defected from the Mossad. Uh, and he indicated, I asked him at this time, he was worried about an assassination plot about President Bush uh, George Bush, the first, the older Bush, and uh, I asked him about the Israeli incident. He says, oh, yes, we knew it was an American ship. There's a naval war room, and they have a big table with a position of all the Israeli ships, and they knew this was an American ship, and he, he said it was just a matter of fact. I, uh, uh, I have no way of verifying that, but I took the matter up in 19... 19- 90. I was appointed by George Bush as the chairman. I was elected chairman of the President's Commission on National Service. George Bush was big on that. And I talked with um, his uh, chief of staff, a fellow named John Sununu, who was a Palestinian by birth. Uh, in any event, George Bush invited the entire crew of the Liberty. I think it was their 25th anniversary. And he invited them to, uh, they were having an anniversary in Washington, he invited them all to the Rose Garden of the White House, and Zanunu came out and shook hands with everybody, and I was there, and George got off his helicopter, and he gave a big wave as he went into the White House, but he didn't stop to talk. And that night, they had a marvelous dinner, and for the first time, the United States Navy honored that crew. Uh, they had a full admiral come to the uh, the dinner, and he, I think he awarded some kind of a commendation medal to everybody that was present. But, you know, it was a terrible thing. That I, I, I was a seaman first sack class at the end of the war. I didn't see any combat. I'd enlisted in 1945. The war ended a couple of months later. But I was in the Navy 19 months, and I am not proud of how the United States Navy has treated this crew. It's been a disgrace. Later, I met uh, the Admiral uh, from Alabama, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and he told me he was absolutely certain the Israelis knew that this attack was real, that the United States government, because of they didn't want to embarrass the Jewish community in the United States, which is solidly for Israel, uh, but he thought it was a tragedy. And we have, uh, I've, I've got the recorded copy of a statement by a former U.S. ambassador who said they were listening when the Israelis were talking about the planned attack on the Liberty, and they had reason. Uh, this was, I think, June 6th, and it was in the Six-Day War. They did not want United States radio intercepts of their orders that they were preparing to attack the Golan Heights. They, they had dealt with the Egyptians, they dealt with the with the Jordanians, and they were planning to attack the Golan Heights. So from their standpoint, they just didn't want any radio intercepts. But what makes you really unhappy about the Israelis was that attempt to machine gun the lifeboats. They didn't want any survivors. And until uh, Sergeant Lockwood, until they got that one radio through and acknowledged by the the fleet commander uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, they were clearly intent on sinking the Liberty and killing all of its crew. And the Liberty's crew, I think that's probably the largest percentage of casualties since World War II. I mean, what was the crew, 280 or some, and 187 wounded and 34 killed? One of them that was killed was Jewish, and they're, uh, they were first honored by the little town of Grafton, Wisconsin, which 
dedicated their library and called it the USS Liberty Library, which was a controversy. But uh, the Liberty crew has, has never been honored for what they did and what they were suffered. I know they were called together in Malden, told they were not to say a word about this under penalty of court-martial. And they broke up the crew and sent them all over in different places. But they've come together. I think this will be their 50th reunion on July 6th. Yes. And they deserve as much honor as any members of the United States Navy. I agree. But let me I thank agree. Let me thank again Marine Sergeant Lockwood. I makes me proud of the Marine Corps. And, you know, the one thing about this damn administration today, they got four former Marine platoon leaders, uh, one chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Dumford, one at the head of the uh, MI, uh, the Defense Department, Jim Mattis, who took the 1st Division into Baghdad. And then they've got this wonderful guy, John Kelly, is at uh, the Department of, uh, what is it, uh, Homeland Security. And now... They've got a former platoon, the Marine platoon leader, Bob Mueller, who's going to run the special counsel investigation. So the only good thing about this administration I've seen recently is those uh, we've got four the Marine, Marine. former Marine platoon <laughs> running That's it. Right. And the Blue Angels are always better than the Navy and everything else, too. It's true. Well, you know, as a, <laughs> as a second lieutenant, you have a dim view of generals and admirals, generally, but... Not a sergeant. Sergeants uh, right higher in the Marine Corps than captains or colonels or generals. Now, you did bring up this USS Liberty Library situation, and you said it was controversial. How come? Well, well, the Jewish community got the idea that somehow to dedicate a library in honor of a ship that had been attacked by the Israels was anti-Semitic. And they dedicated the Golden Meir Library down in Chicago, which is, I don't know, 100 miles south. But the uh, Milwaukee Journal took up the cudgels and said, this is an outrage that uh, we dedicate a ship to the USS Liberty. That'll just raise anti-Semitic uh, attitudes of the United States. But Grafton had a really tough mayor named Jim Grant, as I remember his name. And he'd been a petty officer first class in the Navy. And he said, to hell with it. We're going to, the guys that put up the most money for the library were two old brothers named Grobe, G-R-O-B. And they'd run a machine shop or some kind of plant in Grafton, city of about 20,000. It's up between Milwaukee and Green Bay. And the Grobes put up the the first money for the library. And the concept of raising money, you you promise who puts up the first big money uh, that he'll name the library after him. So after the library had been fully funded, I think $2.2 million or something was being erected out in Grafton, uh, the mayor and the town council go to the Grobe brothers and say, well, do you want to name it after Irwin Grobe or Joseph Grobe? Yeah, these guys are in their 80s. And they said, no, we want to name it after the USS Liberty. So they did. And as I say, it raised the hackles of the Jewish community all the way down to Chicago. And the valedictorian in the high school spoke in her speech that this was anti-Semitic. And a third of the teachers of the high school said it was anti-Semitic. It was a big civic controversy. You can... Find it all in the uh, uh, Milwaukee paper and the Grafton papers of, of those years. But it was a wonderful thing because the Grafton Library, they had the list of the 34 killed. And 33 of them had the American flag and one had the six stars of Israel uh, on his gravestone. That was a wonderful thing. Uh, any event, thank God they're honoring the crew. And I uh, there should have been a lot of silver stars and maybe maybe crosses for that event i should say so i think this is amazing to hear from both of you from this time period because i was born in 1970 and i live literally right next to a navy base quonset point which is the home of the cbs it's time these guys got the honor they deserve and i i would hope that that general trier of president trump who has a fond in the general i hope he'd call him to the White House and honor them on June 6th. Uh, what is that, a week away? Yes. Yeah, it is. Um, now, as you know, far they as deserve the... it. This, this was a terrible, uh, it was understandable. They didn't want to get the Jewish community in America mad. They didn't want to get Israel mad. But to call those planes back uh, at the direct order of, of, of McNamara and Lyndon Johnson, politicians are scared to death of the Jewish community. I remember once uh, an army general, I think, was saying to the Israelis, uh, 
you know, we have to worry about the Congress. And the Israeli leader said to the general, don't worry about us. We own the Congress. And unfortunately, uh, that's why there's been no congressional inquiry. No few congressmen would dare to uh, engage the wrath of the B'nai B'rith or their Jewish communities. And uh, Jews are some of the most wonderful people in the United States. But Israel uh, may be our ally, but they have been capable of some terrible deeds that could lead us into war again. Wow. Now, as far as this um, Adon Tov person, you never heard from him again. Now, do you feel that he really was the Israeli pilot that wouldn't shoot? He admitted that. He said that neither he nor his, I think, the other officer, there were, I think there were eight planes, and I think two of them wouldn't shoot because they saw it was the American flag. And when they returned to the base, uh, at least Tove said that he was arrested and court-martialed and later left. And I don't know what happened to him, but there's no record. After he left the, the prison down in uh, Missouri in November of 1986, I could find no record that ever he went to New York or had been released from New York or where he went from there. He just disappeared. Interesting. Somebody ought to investigate. With yeah, the I should think so. attorneys in New York and there their federal uh, bureaus, where Tove went or, and what happened to him. But I suspect no. uh, the easiest answer is that, that he was either, either Claire Marshall killed or that somehow he was released and their promise uh, to stay low. I've never heard from him since. He was a very able man. I was very impressed with him. I thought he was being truthful, I, and I, I know that he was in great fear that when he served his sentence five years or so, he was afraid of what would happen to him if the Israelis got to him. He was serving time. What he'd done was a bank fraud of some sort. He was, he was charged with embezzlement, which was a felony, that he and his girlfriend had worked some kind of a deal of depositing money in one bank and sending it to another and, and <laughs> withdrawing it uh, some way. Uh, but anyway, he, he, he was very candid about the crime. He had come to the United States. He was living in New York and this girl that he knew, uh, we have her address, uh, had called Jim Ennis, and then Jim had called me. I was acting as a, an attorney for the Jim and the U.S. Liberty Association, and he, he committed the crime in New York, in downtown New York City. Yeah, so he was, it was like a white-collar crime. I, I've got the whole file sitting here with the letters. I have the letter that Avon Tov sent to me. I have the, the transcript, or not, almost, it was like Jim Comey. I made copious notes after my conversations with him, as did Joe Dragner, the attorney in New York. Uh, there's a complete record of Toe, except about his disappearance in 1986, November 18th, I think it was, he was supposed to get released. Well, uh, Dragner, I hope, is still alive. Uh, Artie McHugh passed away. Uh, I'm 89, so uh, uh, this file, if anybody... Uh, uh, and the New York investigative office uh, wanted to find it. Uh, I'll, I'll be glad to turn it over to them. Right on. Okay. Now, now would um, would Lockwood want to say anything to anything else before we clean up here? We got we got a little while longer. Do you want to say anything else? As a matter of fact, uh, Pete brought up the library in Grafton uh, a year ago in January. I was invited to go to Grafton and speak. To the uh, there's a military organization once a month has a guest speaker come in uh, at the Rose Farms American Legion post there in Grafton. It was a packed out crowd, and uh, in, in the conversation that I had with some of the people from Grafton, they had explained to me that prior to World War II, outside of Grafton, there was a rather large community of uh, German immigrants. And about 30 miles northwest of Grafton, in the early 1930s, there was a youth camp which was very similar to uh, Hitler's youth organization camps, and uh, very militaristic and uh, very similar to the ones that Hitler was producing. And, of course, after World War II or during World War II, when there was so much uh, animosity between the Germans and the Jewish community, you should be able to understand that that terrible hatred uh, fell over to the uh, people around the Grafton community as a result of that 
youth camp prior to World I, War II. I had little to that, Sergeant, because I... Uh, I'm sort of a historian or amateur historian, and before World War One, the Germans had uh, emigrated to avoid the draft in Prussia. Uh, a lot of Germans had made beer and came to Wisconsin and Michigan, Minnesota, and there were seven German language uh, newspapers in in Wisconsin in 1916. And of course, they didn't want to go to war against the Kaiser; they were for the the Germans against the British. And so when World War I was declared, they interned a group of Germans in Wisconsin. And and again in World War II, uh, the Germans are the biggest ethnic minority in the United States, but they have no German uh, organizations. They don't call attention to themselves as descendants of Germans that settled in the, in the Midwest, North Midwest, uh, because of the... Uh, shame of the Nazis and uh, in World War II. So you've got the biggest ethnic minority. You got Greek Americans and Italian Americans and Irish Americans, uh, but no German Americans. And that that hostility between Germans and Jews undoubtedly still exists today. Although the Germans have pretty much apologized for Hitler, and uh, the Jews still remember and should remember the Holocaust as. Uh, what Hitler did, but uh, hopefully as time goes on, these animosities between races, uh, hell, my Irish forebears always hated the English. Uh, you know. <laughs> so hopefully as time passes, we get more peace and less fighting. Yeah, <laughs> we can all wish for that, that's for sure. We all feel that way. But now, I, I would I would ask that Sergeant Lockwood email me or send me his address uh, on P.O. Box 3, Rumsey, California, 95679. I'd love to hear from him, talk to him. We'll be in touch, Pete. All right. Well, listen, guys, we've got, we've got maybe 20, 15, 20 minutes left. Is there anything else you guys want to talk about? I mean, this is, we've got the time and this is going all over the world. Well, get the message to Trump to invite the crew of the Liberty. They're going to have a reunion, I think, in Washington. He and his honoring of all the veterans and Arlington Cemetery. You ought to invite the entire crew to the White House, give them a great dinner, and finally honor them for what they went through 50 years ago, June 6th. That would be very prudent PR maneuver on his part, too. That would be good for him to do that. Well, that's what presidents ought to do, or party they're in. Yeah, it's true. I, I was curious about that story. You talked about Bush uh, inviting the entire crew, and he got off the helicopter and waved, but didn't say anything to him. Uh, so well, he was, I, who knows what he was, he walked right past and he waved or saluted him, waved at him. He was maybe a hundred yards away. The Rose Garden is, he, he walked into the White House uh, maybe 50 yards away from where they were. We were all having a picnic. I mean, I think they had a barbecue for us. One other thing that, that makes us all mad, McGonagall must have been one hell of a skipper to get that ship that had been torpedoed and machine gunned and two-thirds of its people casualties. He was able to limp it into Malta and save the ship. Well, they gave him the Congressional Medal of Honor, but it's the only time in the history of the White House where that Medal of Honor was awarded down at 8th and I in the Navy Yard. It wasn't awarded in the White House, which gives you an idea how a Democratic president was fearful of the Jewish community rising up if he honored the captain of the ship that had been sunk, damn near sunk by the Israelis. That gives you an idea of the politics of Washington, that LBJ was afraid to give that Medal of Honor in the Oval Office or the East Room of the White House, where it should have been given, but quietly gave it to him in the Naval Yard with no publicity. Terrible. I could remark briefly about the uh, deal in the Rose Garden, Pete. That was where I met you, right there on the portico in the front of the White House. Who's this talking? Um, this is the old Sarge. <laughs> hey, what rank do you hold when you retired, Sergeant? I was a gunnery sergeant. Well, hell, I was scared to death of you when I was a second lieutenant, but I, I can tell you a funny story. When I was in the Congress, we had 21 former Marines in the House, and we had eight senators, and they were famous guys, John Clem, the Orbit of the Earth, Jack, uh, John Chafee uh, was from Rhode Island, the senator, and he'd been a rifleman in Guadalcanal. He had a rifle company in Korea. When I was there, and John was in the Senate, but about every two months we had a breakfast uh, of the former Marines in the Rayburn office building, and time came where 
I was, I'd been in Congress three or four years, and I got to be the MC. We rotated it. And I'm standing up, and I'm introducing the comment down to the Marine Corps, and, and uh, he did, won the Congressional Medal of Honor on Guam, a famous guy, but he's a general, and I introduce him and go through his accomplishments and his record. And all the 29 Marines sitting out there, they all attended this breakfast every two months to listen to the Commandant. And everybody clapped. And the Commandant, he stands up and he, and he has a guy next to him stand up, big beefy guy, and he says, Gentlemen, let me introduce to you the Sergeant Major of the United States Marine Corps. And to a man, every former Marine stood up and clapped, which kind of got the message to the Commandant that Marines will always respect sergeants more than generals. When, when we were there in the East Garden, uh, you, you mentioned, Pete, that the president just waved at us and went on into the White House and sent uh, John Sununu and Brent Scowcroft over. Yeah, Brent's and wonderful. What struck me about John Sununu was how fake he was. He was coming by and shaking hands, hi, how are you, hello, how are you, hi, how are you, and would not look any of us in the eye. Standing right next to me was the son of our uh, clerk who was killed in the attack on the Liberty. And uh, it, his name was uh, Spiker. And I remember uh, Spiker's son saying at the time, we just got snookered. Well, I don't know. You know, that affair was held because I made the request to George Bush personally that that happened. And uh, was that a captain or an admiral that came over and gave all you guys the medals? I, I don't recall exactly when it was, Pete, but it, yes, there was a Navy officer that came over, and what he did was he presented us our uh, uh, presidential unit citation. Uh, where, <laughs> 30 years later, 20, what was it, 90, 25 uh, years after the event, the Navy calling you in and telling you to be court-martialed if you revealed anything that had happened to the Liberty. That was a terrible thing for the Navy to do, and they were just as bad with the Pueblo, you know, the... Pueblo, seven months later, uh, what was it? Uh, I was just, I'd just been elected to Congress uh, in January of 1968. And they send the Pueblo up against the North Koreans and they don't have any supporting ships or planes. And the Pueblo gets captured by the North Koreans. That was seven months there, after you guys. There's, there's quite a story behind the Pueblo attack, too. Uh, my wife and I became acquainted with uh, Pete Rose Booker. We were having breakfast together out in San Diego. This is in uh, 19. 97, Pete leaned across the breakfast table and, and looked me in the eye, and he said, Bryce, if I had known about the USS Liberty, we, we never would have left Pearl, Pearl Harbor. And he qualified that. He would have demanded an escort for his mission. And the capture well, was that the Navy? I have a, he I'm drew sorry. a picture of the, of the Pueblo for me. I have it hanging in my office. Uh, and I, you know, I went to North Korea a couple of years ago, and the Pueblo is sitting in the river. <laughs> right next to the statue of Kim Il Sung in downtown Pyongyang, they captured it and somehow got it around to, to North Korea. But uh, they tortured those group members, and the Pueblo is a very small ship. It's not more than 100 feet long, I don't think. I believe there were 84 crewmen aboard the Pueblo. What Pete also did not know, you find this out in his book, uh, My Story by Pete Booker, uh, two weeks prior to the, the capture of the Pueblo, there had been a group of uh, 20-some North Korean uh, commandos that had gone to Seoul with the idea of uh, killing the South Korean president. and uh, They wanted to assassinate him. He, one of their presidents was later assassinated by the head of the Korean CIA. They had a tough government for a few years. When the North Koreans saw the Pueblo off their coast, they assumed that it was a reprisal for that attack against the uh, the South Korean president, and, of course, took appropriate action. Yep, and now, now it is 2017, and we're looking at going to war with North Korea again. Thank uh, you. Thank I you for wrapping that back up to this point. Thank you, because it feels like history just keeps repeating itself. And I've been listening to these stories, and it's full of intrigue. I mean, this could be a, a movie. I mean, it could be a Hollywood movie, listening to each one of these things. And... <laughs> It, you know, it's amazing to me that this stuff went unreported, but yet is so important as far as our history goes. And like I was telling you guys earlier, I grew up in, I was born in 1970. I don't know about any of this stuff. And I think this is so important that this gets documented. I am going to send transcripts of this whole two hours 
to both of you. And this is going to be recorded. It's going to be on YouTube. It's going to be the archive sections of American Freedom Radio. It's going to be on our, our archives for shadowcitizen.online. It's going to be on YouTube, Vimeo, and on SoundCloud. And very soon, these will be made into podcasts so people could plug them into their earbuds and listen to them while they jog or do whatever they're going to do. But I think this is an important document for people that are studying history. And I know that the um, current educational system is not the best, and I really like this to be passed on virally on the Internet, what you guys have just told. Well, it takes 50 years sometimes to unravel the history of what happened. I was thinking back of that attack on the Maddox and the Turner Joy the first attack attack occurred. The second one, they had a guy named Jim Stockwell who was flying over, I think, the Turner Joy, and and uh, he'd been ordered to stuff these torpedo boats, and, and he said, there aren't any torpedo boats down there, and some uh, Navy radio man had mistakenly mistaken something for torpedo boats, but what nobody knew at the time when Lyndon Johnson and McNamara went to the Congress to ask for the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, that was, I think, July 1964, they never told the Congress that, uh, that those ships could very well have been thought to have been screening an amphibious operation. They had a program called 34A or something where we were supporting the South Vietnamese and going north of the dividing line and, and attacking the North Vietnamese coast. So it was pretty understandable that the first attack that they would come out to, to attack the United States ships. But that was used as the excuse for going to war in Vietnam because Congress unanimously, almost unanimously, Past the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. And then, of course, in Iraq, uh, Cheney tells us, oh, no, we know that Saddam Hussein is in touch with al-Qaeda. So we go to war against Iraq, again on false information furnished from the White House. Thank you both so much for being with us. Honestly, it's been my honor, my pleasure, and I'm very, very proud to be associated with you. Shadow Citizen with Rachel L. McIntosh and Rob O'Sell. No rules, no rules, no taboo topics, no taboo topics, no fear of doom, no fear of doom.